A very good morning and welcome to this edition of Morning at NTV's Big Story. This morning, as the rest of the world joins the European Union commemorating yet another Europe Day, we have the pleasure of hosting the European Union Ambassador to Uganda, His Excellency Ambassador Christian Schmidt. Good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning, sir. Europe-Uganda relations. Let's start from the broad way of looking at it. How would one describe Europe-Uganda relations as of now? Well, I think they are perhaps better than, than ever. Um, not just touching on development and cooperation, but on trade. We have signed a, an economic partnership agreement with the East African community. Uh, we have solved uh, some of the differences we had last year over legislation. Uh, we just had a political dialogue with His Excellency the Presidency. The President, that was all very good. Um, so I, I think they are, they, are, they are good. I'll take you on from the point of the political dialogue with the President that you just had, which is still hot off the oven. What were some of the major salient issues that were as a hallmark of this discussion? We covered all issues, mm -hmm. but I would perhaps single out uh, the preparations for Uganda's elections next year. Very important. Mm -hmm. um, there we had an opportunity to hear from the president that uh, uh, Uganda was uh, aiming for free and fair elections and in fact invited the European Union to observe those elections uh, next year. Your Excellency, the last time we had an election in Uganda, which was 2011, there was a huge production of European Union observers. Mm -hmm. And in their recommendation, they did highlight very seriously that there were certain electoral reforms that were, unless they were in place, the election would not be what the name that is called. Mm -hmm. And key among them were, one, some amendments with regard to the composition of the Electoral Commission and some very other key legislative changes within the electoral law. When you spoke to the President and he assured you a free and fair election, how much did he speak to the fact that the Electoral Commission composition and election reform, electoral reforms are to be tabled in the little time still available? Now, I will answer that question, but I think it's fair uh, to start a lot earlier. Uh, and in fact, the President did that uh, in our discussions. By uh, looking back uh, into the 80s and, and seeing how the current government, uh, in fact, went through the bush because of the rigged elections uh, uh, before, before that, well, from that discussion, when you sum it up, mm. the sense you get from President Museveni, and sorry if I'm dragging you in that direction, but I'm sure uh, from every discussion there has to be a question of believability. If you had to put President Museveni on a believability index, when you walked out of that room, did you believe him that there was that huge political will on his side and his government side to deliver a free and fair election to Ugandans? Well, Simon, I'm the ambassador of the European Union to Uganda. I do not give grades and scores to the, to the, to the government or to the... Uh, to the president. What I will say is that there is uh, a electoral reform bill now uh, in Parliament uh, that does address one of the issues that not just the European Union has, has, has advocated for, but perhaps a lot more importantly, the Ugandan Human Rights Commission, uh, clergy, uh, civil society, uh, and also uh, cross-partisan forces in Parliament, all saying there needs to be a reform of how the electoral commission is constituted. Ambassador, Uganda obviously doesn't play as an island state. Mm -hmm. You know, what affects our polity here does mm -hmm. have a cascading effect on the rest of Africa. Mm -hmm. But I also want to put to you your views on African democratization, as it is the new wave of democratization. Mm -hmm. You issues in Burundi and certainly mm -hmm. have come to the fore now simmering tensions because of the disrespect of certain legal frameworks put in place. Southern Sudan is yet to be sorted out. The DRC remains a fragile uh, situation. Of course, you've got new challenges coming in by the Al-Shabaab and all that. Mm -hmm. With all this happening, and of course, the so others would want to call it abortive Arab Spring in the north mm -hmm. of Africa, mm -hmm. where there was a, new, a hope anticipated, but that hope seemed to have decimated in thin air. Mm -hmm. How would you draw an African picture mm -hmm. of governance or democratization from your viewpoint? Well, there's, there's a lot of in that, in, in that question, but <laughs> let, me, let me start with Europe. Uh, we have democracy, but we don't always elect the best leaders. No? Oh, that happens? That happens. That's really, <laughs> okay, that's very good. But you see, one important observation I want to make is that uh, democracy in Europe survives even if the leader that is elected turns out to be a bad leader. If leaders break their words or break the constitution, of course, people feel betrayed. To, to summarize my answer, uh, institutions in many places are not yet strong enough 
So yeah. I'm dwelling so much on this governance question, mm. but if I were just to ask a final one on the governance question, mm. for how long can the word institutions are not strong enough be touted? When will these institutions be strong, at least strong enough to avert this kind of unconstitutional changes that we seem to witness every so often? Well, again, um, let's be also modest on the European side. It has taken centuries, centuries, uh, to reach the maturity of European institutions and checks and balances. Uh, so I think we should also recognize that uh, these institutions are, uh, in many cases, fairly new. Uh, you are probably familiar with the Mo Ibrahim Prize, of course, which uh, is, is, is given to African leaders uh, by Africans, to leaders who have shown that they have done something good for their people and handed over power peacefully. It's been in place, I think, for, for eight years, but it's only been handed out four times. Well, I'm sure good luck, Jonathan, may be rubbing his hands to get that as well. <laughs> well, you mentioned Nigeria, uh, and, and I think that is a, uh, a very positive example, and also an example of what electoral uh, reform and an independent electoral commission can do. Your Excellency, most importantly, obviously, the European Union is more revered for its development cooperation, mm. with especially Uganda. And mm. uh, we're speaking now at the, you know, just concluded finalization of a huge successful project for northern Uganda mm -hmm. and Karamoja region. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take stock of that, and then we now look at what next, because we know that you have the 11th European Development Fund that's just been signed with the government of Uganda for the next five years. What are some of the crucial areas you'll be looking at? But let's start from what you would make of the Karamoja Livelihood Program and that li uh, Livelihood pro Program for Northern Uganda? Well, that is what we did in Northern Uganda together with the Minister for Karamoja and, and with the local authorities there is one of the things where I think we can be really proud uh, of what has been achieved. Uh, proud for Uganda because uh, the transition from, from conflict to peace uh, was a Ugandan achievement. Uh, so the scene was set uh, for, for development. We're proud of the European Union because we came in right, uh, right uh, from the beginning to say, well, peace, right, but then what? You need to immediately show the dividend, absolutely, the peace dividend. Proponents of this model will say that you responded to the identified needs of the community, mm. but still, opponents of development cooperation will say you sit in a room in Brussels somewhere, think up of a development uh, silver bullet, mm. and come to impose it in an area like Uganda. Mm. And so many people will say, did Caliph and Arab actually achieve what the people of Karamoja and Northern Uganda wanted it to achieve, or did it achieve what the whims and fancies were of the coiners of this program from their air-conditioned uh, places of abode in Brussels? Yeah, well, I wouldn't be proud if you were right about that. Uh, but I know for a fact that this is not how this program was conceived, nor is the way we will conceive the next step, because I, I think it's important to, to, to say that we are proud of what was achieved, mm -hmm. but when we have a success, we don't just walk away. In, in fact, we are going to uh, probably double uh, over the next uh, uh, many years. So we're talking about 15 million euro for each, now it's going to be 30 million euro or thereabouts. No, the, the total of those two programs was something like 35 million euros, uh -huh. um, and we will probably double that to cover all of northern Uganda, 30 districts, 7 million people. Um, so, uh, and what will, what will be your areas of focus this time around? Because now previously you just enumerated it was putting a state in place, ensuring that now you begin to change, your yeah. carry out a mind shift change and say, look, you can farm, you can open fields, you need to engage in agriculture. Now this time around, what are you going to be looking at? I think we should look at, first of all, nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, as agriculture is taking off, it's important to understand that it's not just a question of producing, but also consuming in order for uh, uh, the malnourished children to, to you know, get out of that. So True. nutrition is an important cross-sectoral uh, issue. We'll continue with livelihoods, uh, agricultural productivity, mm -hmm. farmer schools. Um, okay. These are important uh, things. Uh, we have also discussed with the government um, rolling out, supporting rolling out the land policy. Uh, Uganda has a very good land policy but it needs to be implemented. Absolutely. You know, this is a region where uh, I it's think... communal land, nobody really... Well, you know. yeah. So uh, if you want to invest in agriculture, security of tenure, of, of tenure is, is important also because there, are, there is now increasing external pressure from investors, Why mi not? mining and so and, and, and what used to be a, a, a conflict uh, over cows 
could very quick, quickly turn into a conflict over land. Mm. When it comes to development cooperation and every other intervention that requires a bit of money, mm. you know the elephant in the room mm -hmm. that has bedeviled this country for quite some time, yes. and that's corruption. I knew you were going to say that. Absolutely, without a doubt. I mean, to what extent are you convinced that this elephant in the room will not devour these otherwise well-meaning projects and interventions that you have in the pipeline? Well, I've given two examples where I can say with full confidence that not a single euro has been lost. We had the final audits on the Ugandan, Northern Uganda programs. Oh, and they so were Arab and Kali, not a single under the euro. Prime Minister's office, specifically the Minister for Karamoja and Oil. Correct. Not a euro was. No. Oh, that's a fast. Well, you know, when there are good news, you should take note. Absolutely. Now, that for me has come in as shockingly good news. <laughs> yeah. So it's possible. Um, what is important is... Were you only lucky or there was some very strong interventions? There was very close scrutiny. And very you intend to carry on that? Mm -hmm. and, a strong, and a strong project management on the Ugandan side. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you're right. It is a problem, and it's a problem in the road sector. Not with the roads that we have constructed, but tender procedures that are not transparent and end up, in some cases, being granted to companies that don't exist. Now, that shouldn't be possible. Well, uh, I think some intervention is already in place. We have a new executive director of the Roads Authority, so perhaps yes. that's going to be I wish her well, and we will work very closely with her. But clearly, uh, the National Roads Agency is of strategic importance, and it has to work. Um, so uh, procurement procedures have to be transparent, not just in order not to waste money, but also to get com give confidence to companies who want to come to Uganda to bid to open the market and give you a bigger choice. Yeah. What specific interventions do you have up your sleeve for infrastructure development, if at all? So I think infrastructure, uh, one should uh, now adopt a modern mm. transport policy. And Uganda indeed is doing that uh, in the context of the National Development Plan. Mm -hmm. um, it is not just roads. It's very important to recognize that uh, water transport is the safest, most clean, uh, ecological way of transport. Yeah? Uh, bulk traffic, I mean, if you could get some of the, of the heavy traffic off the roads, it would be good for road safety, and it would be good for, for, for road maintenance, because many of the roads are suffering under overweight uh, lorries. So for me, who lives in just near Port Bell and works in Jinja, mm -hmm. and I think the, inter the European Union is trying to advise me to now use a boat from Port Bell to Jinja, the Jinja Pier. No, <laughs> because you are not bulk, you're not bulk traffic, I think. <laughs> you're a slim man and you, you don't need to go by boat. But uh, what I'm saying, Your Excellency, is that is there going to be now a deliberate effort on the part of the European Union's yes. development I, that's agenda with saying. Uganda yeah. to say, let's promote, say, water, marine transport? Exactly. And not because we have invented that in some office in Brussels, mm -hmm. <laughs> but because <laughs> this was indeed the priority expressed to us and we agreed. Yeah? So what we are, uh, are planning to do in the next phase is support Uganda on what is called intermodal transport. The ability to take traffic and, 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 and cargo on a, on a ship, have a, a loading facility where you then put it either on a, on, on a rail or on, on a truck. But unless you have these, uh, these uh, terminals, mm -hmm. uh, then it's too complicated. You're very right. So, so are you going into the building of the terminals? Or possibly. Okay. Uh, charting Lake Victoria, because uh, there is very little regulation on Lake Victoria. So if you want to have uh, uh, traffic on the lake, then you, you need, need a it. regulatory uh, agency and you need uh, sea lanes that are safe and dedicated to, uh, to, to traffic. To traffic and yeah. all that. But it's not just Lake Victoria, of course, there are ah, the also water bodies, absolutely. water bodies in, in Uganda where this could be exploited. It is. Your Excellency, I love not only just following the money, but I also mm. love to follow the time, time, timelines. Mm. What timelines are we looking at here? Well, we are discussing this already. We are in the middle of setting up the plans for the next uh, uh, program phase. So. Uh, my people and are working on, on all these ideas very, very busily. Your Excellence, of course, Uganda-EU relations couldn't be better at this point in time. But there were times when they have been on a rocky path perhaps even in a very rocky chair. And uh, I'm sure you remember some of those times. Oh, no, I've forgotten all of that. <laughs> well, let me just remind you a little bit. There was a time there was this legislation that came onto what? the table. What? Well, I love the feigning of ignorance on this one. We're talking about the legislation that touch the real core of mother's human rights. And we're talking mm -hmm. about the gay bill, to mm -hmm. be very exact. Sure. I'm sure this must have come up in your, your Article 8 discussion with the President most recently. How are we on that? 
Well, uh, in fact, it didn't really come up. Oh, I'm glad it didn't. And it wouldn't have to, because from our perspective, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, that issue was dealt with last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we had dialogue. We've stated our positions uh, with mutual respect. And I think uh, our partnership came out stronger uh, after this. What, of course, is not behind us are uh, uh, the violations that, uh, of human rights and, and, and child defilement um, and some of the concerns that were behind uh, uh, this piece of legislation. Uh, so I, I wouldn't want to say that all problems have been solved, but the way that piece of legislation was drafted made it discriminatory. Uh, and so I think we have to find ways of addressing these problems of, of child abuse in, in, in other manners. Another little elephant in the room, and that's the issue of corruption. Yes, we have and puff about corruption, and of course there's a myriad of organizations in this country that are anti-corruption agencies by everything, including an anti-corruption court. Mm. But what we see now is allegedly corrupt officials or individuals going through the legal framework and working out scot free Doesn't that bother you sometimes at the European Union, that these, all these plethora of organizations, mm. but no harsh punishment or deterrent measures are in place to stop corruption from being perpetuated further? Does it bother me? I think it's more important to ask, does it bother the Ugandans? Greatly, I would imagine. Um, and I would say if it does, then it is the role of parliaments to be the watchdog on this. I have seen that uh, Uganda has the institutions and the legislation mm -hmm. in place. Uh, the Auditor General, I think, is, is doing an excellent job um, preparing reports mm -hmm. uh, and identifying the problems and then passing them on to Parliament. I think this is where the problem may arise, uh, follow up by the Parliament, the Public Accounts Committee, uh, making sure that uh, impunity is, is not allowed, or that um, the, um, the director the of public prosecution, for example, does prosecute the right people. Yes, I mean, so yeah, so the small fish uh, don't get court, more, more fried than the. But the big fish. Uh, Gets away. I noticed that the, the excellent new Chief Justice has pointed to a problem of exactly that, of corruption in the judiciary. Because if you can bribe a judge, obviously the big fish will get away because they are capable of bribing better than the small fish. So there is an inequity in the fight against corruption uh, in, in the system. Um, and I really think that this is something that Parliament should uh, take seriously uh, and where the government should support the efforts of the new Chief Justice to deal with it. A very f well, one of the final ones we have, and uh, we would wish you to speak to this, we've imposed on ourselves a ban on agricultural exports mm -hmm. to the European Union market yes. because of several concerns that have been raised, high levels of pesticides, substandard you know, quality of goods and all that. You may wish to speak to that. Has you kind of done a good thing to self-impose and carry out some kind of quality checks mm -hmm. before Brussels imposes you? Right. Well, first of all, I want to clarify that that, that issue concerns not agricultural products at large. Mm -hmm. It concerns uh, the very specific business of red pepper and partly flowers. Well, even some green pepper, I'm sure. Pepper. <laughs> uh, and the specific problem is the presence of uh, of pest in the in the fruits when they are exported to Europe. Now that is a problem because it makes it unsafe for human consumption, but it also risks contaminating your other productions in, in Europe because this pest can spread to peaches, uh, peaches and citrus, apples and all that. Exactly, and that the economic impact of that would be quite serious. Now. Europe is a very cold place sometimes. We need red pepper, you know, from, from Uganda to give us a <laughs> fire. So we want to import these products, and we have done so more and more over the years. What has happened in Uganda is that uh, the industry now is a little bit the, the victim of its own success. What was a controlled production by bigger farms has spread out to a lot of small outgrowers that do not respect uh, good practices in terms of drying fruit on the ground, 
uh, etc. And, and simply the whole su supply, supply chain, chain is getting is contaminated no, in its own way, yes. Well, you can't trace the problem back. When we see a consignment is infected, you cannot trace to which farm it came. So I would say for the sake of European consumers, but also for the sake of Uganda, of, of Uganda yeah. I mean, this is unsafe for us, but it's also unsafe for you. True that. And there's an economic loss in not being able to manage that supply chain. Mm. Uh, and so we have now for over a year drawn the attention uh, of the Ugandan authorities to this problem that whatever is done, we still see these consignments arrive uh, with these pests. questions. Yes. And, and, and so I think to answer your question, the decision on the Ugandan side to hold these consignments back until they sort out the problem is the right one. But what I really would like to see to be is that the problem quickly. is solved and, quickly. That, and that these exports, you know, double or triple or whatever, uh, because this is what we want, more trade and, and revenue for Ugandan uh, farmers. Your Excellency, it's a pleasure having You're this welcome. discussion with you that and is on a better note and of course it's been very enlightening to hear from Thank you, you what the European Union has under its sleeve with regard to Uganda-EU relations. We'll take a short break and return and Simon says. <laughs> Well, you heard it from the ambassador. Clearly, Europe-Uganda relations hinge on very fundamental principles. But let's talk about just four of these, which we talked about extensively in the interview. One of them is governance. The other is uh, development. The other is related development. We call it development cooperation. And of course, the other is looking out for environmental uh, partnerships here and there. And of course, we also need to talk about matters of terror. You realize that all these uh, tenets really speak to the core of what governments in Africa, and very specifically in Uganda, should be doing for and by their citizens. The European Union, for the most part, increasingly is moving away from the boisterous big brother of saying, do this, but it's coming down to say, what can we do together for the good of your community, of the global community in which all of us live? And I think it's very important to perpetuate these relations that are taking increasingly a more equal partnership approach rather than one superintending over the other. And as of course Europe celebrates yet another land of Europe Day, it's important to you know hold it to that purpose of saying, look, we are in this together, we are partnering, but of course we also have a huge contribution to make the development of not only just this country, but for the global region in which we all play our trade. Have a wonderful and productive day. It's been a pleasure as always and we meet the same time, same place tomorrow as we have yet another insightful discussion. Thank you.